Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the course Decoding Comic Studies and Reading Graphic Narratives in 21st Century India. So, we are uh, discussing in fact, uh, talking about the history of western comics and we were more focused on European and American uh, comic studies and we were looking at how it developed. And most importantly, what I was trying to make you understand that why are we talking about these, uh, why, are, why am I talking about the history of western comics? Because when you are going to read comic studies, you should know how it developed, what are the changes that took place, what are the transformation, what are the factors that influenced comic studies and today in current shape, what kind of new discourses are emerging and why those kind of discourses are taking place. So, this is a one important reason. The second important reason why I am talking about history of western comics is so that you can know lot of books available in history which will shape your understanding of comics. And the third reason when we are going for the literature review, it would be very helpful to know the history of western comics. And the fourth, I am sure that everyone knows that we cannot understand any discipline or let us say for example, any discourse until and unless we are into the history of it, right. So, these are the major important reason why are we here and why we are talking about the history of western comics. I am taking the history of western comics in details. The reason is that I am very particular about talking about the changes and significant contribution made by certain comic artists and also most importantly how the particular culture the way it was emerging and comic studies how they both responded to each other right. So, in, in fact if you recall in the last class I also talked about that through comic studies we can also know the history of America right. So, I was talking about that how history of a western comics can tell you lot about the culture of a particular country all right. So, moving forward from where I have left. So, go to the slide please and you see here that there is another contribution made by uh, theory Smolderen right. So, after looking at Hogarth what we see here that when we are garnering a holistic understanding of the form. Theory Smolderin coins the term polygraphic humor. That is a very important term and I will explain what this uh, term suggests. Polygraphic humor to explain the plates of Hogarth, the complexity of the narrative in the plates is caused by stylistic collisions, ironic contrast and hybridization where Hogarth depended heavily on the pre photographic tradition of illustration. The multiple layers in Hogarth's engravings which allow the reader to be detective, hence creating in a single plate a polographic space finds its inspiration in a much later genre in the comics medium that is called the graphic novel. A smoldering links Mikhail Bhaktin's reading of novels as a polyphonic narratives to contemporary reading of a graphic novel as exercises in polygraphic space thus creating a parallel connecting 18th and 19th century humoristic illustrators today's graphic novelist and the literary tradition tracing through the works of novelists like Henry Fielding, Tobias Smollett, Lawrence Stern, Charles Dickens and William Macbeth Thackeray among others into a deep relationship will be elaborated later in this lecture where the oral and the visual 
intervene on the printed page to create a holistic work of art. Navigating through the structures and intricacies of this polygraphic space was rewarding because this was where artist ironically stylized and compounded different systems of representation and it marked almost all overview of early comics. All right. So, what I am trying to make you understand that the very contribution of uh, uh, polygraphic humor or let us say put it this, this polygraphic space. Before I get into this and to make you more exp uh, like to make you more clearly what this all about is, let me give an example. Think about the work produced by Mikhail Bhaktin. There are certain terms like say for example, heteroglossia, polyphony, dialogism, these are very uh, uh, familiar terms which are mainly associated with Mikhail Bhaktin. And obviously, you also know about the carnivalesque which I will discuss later part of uh, this lecture. So, first let me talk about what is a polyphony, right. Polyphony when Mikhail Bhaktin is talking about obviously, what he has in the mind that how multiple voices are coming into the picture and they all are sometime overlapping, overlapping and in fact, he meant that authorial voice are dismantled or to put it this way that there are many voices available on a in a culture or let us say in a particular text. The job of a reader is to find out those voices available not only depending on the authorial voice, which means what is suggest two things. One is authorial voice are not only significant, there are other voices too which also contribute in forming a book or let us say in knowing about a particular culture that is a one. Second thing is that the hierarchy was subverted right, where only one voice is superior and other voices are inferior that kind of a hierarchy was subverted by Mikhail Bhaktin all right. That is a one idea and in the same way polygraphic humor was coined. What I mean by this let me explain to you in a more detailed way. Look at this term poly and plus graphic. I will not talk about the humor hold it uh, for a second. Poly plus graphic as you could see poly means many graphic means lot of pictures. What happens in the comics? You see that this is not only one story running at one point of time. There are many narratives are running. What I mean to say by this is that let us say for example, when you open a book you see on a comic book when you open it, what do you find? You find that it is not only talking about that what a character is doing. Let us say for example, a character is eating a breakfast. At the same time, there is some other graphic narrative which is speaking about your health or lifestyle. At the same time, it is also talking about that how you are going to cope up in a contemporary society where health is becoming an important concern. So, here you see that the job of reader is to be more attentive to find out polygraphic narratives available in a particular comics, where you see it is not just one story running, but there are multiple running, there are multiple stories running parallelly, right. So, one let us say for example, what you are doing in your everyday activities that is shown. At the same time, if you look at more closely, it is also talking about health habits. It is also talking about the third one may be possible possibility is that is also trying to talk about that how we can understand that how this particular health habit you are going to cope up with in a contemporary society where health is going to be one important challenge for like for the people who want to maintain it right. So, I am just giving you one example second you can say let us say for example, a person is going to fight a war against a particular country and the same time morality is being shown that why people are fighting and the third it is also talking about that how women are not allowed to be participate in this particular war something like this. So, what I mean to say is that there are not one not two, but there are many stories running parallelly on the same page what Mikhail Bhakti says polyphony in the same way Smolderan is talking about 
polygraphic. Obviously, humor simply means that the purpose is to evoke laughter, right. Give me one more minute to explain why uh, I talked about Dickens, Smollett, Lawrence Stern, which I will be talking about, or let us say, for example, Macbeth Thackeray. Who are these people? Why are we talking about them? As a student of literature, we all know that they are Victorian novelists. What are they doing? Let me focus on just Dickens, not more than that, because we will take a lot of time. Dickens has written a lot of novels. Novels are like this Oliver Twist, Nicholas Nickelby, and etcetera. Dickens novel does not come in a one day that you get to know read all the novels, uh, sorry, all the chapters. Initially, what Dickens used to do, I mean, the, the trend was he used to write a novel in the form of chapters, like one chapter came out, people read it they are curious what is going to happen the next week when Dickens is going to write the second chapter of Oliver Twist, then third, then fourth, then fifth, which means that people are reading not in one go, but they are reading chapter by chapter and later on it was combined and today we read it in a one uh, form that is called novel and we get to know the entire story of Dickens, right. What is the another important reason? Look at the comics, the same thing used to happen. Second reason is what? The second reason is you could see that if you are reading, like if you have read Dickens novels, you see there is also illustration, which means that there is also pictures drawn on the pages. What are these pictures trying to suggest? It has something to do with the comic and all those illustrations done by kind of artists later on they turned out to be comic artists, right. So, if you I, like in fact, you must do you go back and see the Victorian novelist, let us say for example, Dickens and you see these novels, you will find that there are illustrations, right. There are illustrations and what does this illustration do? These illustrations, the purpose is to create humor to add another story. Sometime what happens like we do not look at this illustration, we think that is not important, these are useless, but my dear students as a, as a good reader, our job is to read these narratives, so that we can know how these illustrations also contribute in shaping the meaning of the novel, right. Moreover, you should also pay attention that why Dickens felt like it is important to keep certain illustration on the pages. All right. So, later on what I was point, point I was making that these illustrations turned out to be a, they turned out to be a comic artist. The third, if you look at the Dickens contribution also in a fact that he used to give a graphic description of their characters, which means that he used to explain and give the details, how does the fagging look or let us say, how innocent. Oliver Twist is, it is not just by talking about that he or she is innocent or villainous character, but he used to define and write in a such a way that their picture used to come in a mind, right. Okay, this particular character look like this, all right. So, you see that it is a more or less that how comic studies and novels are interrelated with each other, all right. So, moving ahead. Let me show you the slide where we are going to talk about Thomas Rowelson, all right. So, before delving into the next major theme, right, which is like talking about the history of early comics. So, I will talk about Toffler later. It is important to address another artist whose style is set apart from that of Hogarth and it influences how comics would start shaping itself as a flexible medium. So, English artist here we have the, uh, the contribution made by Thomas Rowelson's book called Suitable Restrictions that came out in 1789. So, English artist Thomas Rowelson whose work when placed alongside Hogarth seems almost barbaric in comparison, both repetitive and lavish. While 
Hogarth's engraving were readable, complex and intricate, Rawlson's sketches appeared to be isolated, superficial and fragmentary incident. All right. So, before I move further, what I am asking you to pay your attention on, look at this picture, this taken from suitable restrictions by Thomas Rawlson's suitable restriction that came out in 1789. Now, I will ask you to do the comparison and contrast between Thomas Rawlson's and Hogarth. So, here we have the Hogarth where we see the one plate analysis of a beauty and here we have a Thomas Rawlson suitable restrictions. Do not you see the kind of a changes and shift that we see in Hogarth's plate and we see in the plate of suitable restrictions? That is the question that you should look at carefully and see. What interestingly we find that Hogarth right? and before I move ahead, I would like to uh, explain again one thing important for you that the difference between a certain comic artist is like this. There are someone who is as like I spoke also before, they are core academician in the sense that they have learnt how to do painting. right? They have learnt how to do painting. So, let us say for example, there is a particular format and particular norms through which only they will do the painting. Otherwise, they will not prescribe some other form of painting as a painting. right? But there are lot of people who do experimentation with a particular kind of art, which means that it is not that they have come out of a particular school, it is not like they have be, they were trained in a particular academia, it is not like they study in a particular institution a particular art, but then what? They have not learnt anything, but they have experimented this with this particular art. Let me give you an example. Let us say for example, music. Right? There are many institutions available where you can go and you can learn music. Right? But there are lot of people, they produce music, they sing songs. However, they were not ever trained. They never joined any institution. They were never went to any school. They, were, they never had a kind of institutional mentor who trained them. What is the point I am making? The point I am making is that keep in the mind that there are certain comic artists who are trained and there are someone who are not trained, they just experiment with their own style and whatever they learn from their own skill. right? So, when they both are trying to do with a particular art, obviously their way of uh, producing art will be very different. All right? So, keeping this in the mind, we are going back to see the comparison between William Hogarth and Raw Wilson's. All right. So, look at the slide please and you notice here that uh, Hogarth discussed idea of a beauty and the grace in art and Raw Wilson's drawing toppled this construct of a standard beauty posed by Hogarth. So, Rowell, Rowell and Sons work almost bordered on the abstract, on the abstract uh, and appeared incomplete or hardly as rough sketches when compared to the finished plates of Hogarth. It is through an energetic and molecular interpretations of analysis of a beauty via the drawing of Rowell and Sons that we must consider the relation between Toffer's story and the formal theories of Hogarth. All right. so, so, the point what I am making over here is that when you see any discipline or let us say for example, when you see any particular of art, there are two ways to look at it. One, how it was like how it developed institutionally which has a certain formal theories and then how certain people who were interested in a particular art and they did experiment with particular form format or they challenged and they found their own way to express certain things. All right? So, keep these two things in mind and that is what it happens. So, here 
we are not going to say that formal theories of a particular art is more significant and the form like which uh, came by a certain set of people and they are talking about it's not important no our job is to look at what are they doing with it how are they doing with it in fact when they do with these things what come out of it right so this is our job and that is how we are going to approach these uh, kind of art and being particular about comic studies all right so now moving ahead when we have a another person called Rodolfo Toffer, right, is important for a one reason that people call him the father of the comics strip, all right. So, this is a very uh, important because uh, he is the person who is designated, who are considered as the father of a comics strip. So, he is the son of a Swiss caricaturist and painter in Geneva and would himself follow the footsteps of his father into the profession of illustration. The person who called him the father of a comic strip is none other than the very famous person look at on your screen I am writing his name and I am sure that you can immediately identify no one else than David Kunzle, right. He is the one who gave him this title father of the comic is David Kunzle. all right. So, uh, so in little of his book that was published in 2007, Toffer's art style which falls somewhere between amateurishness and clumsiness seemed to be so by deliberate choice. Toffer, Toffer started publishing in the 1830s about a century after Hogarth. Now, you could see that he is coming after 100 years of Hogarth, but it was not until 1842 when the original Swiss edition of Les Adventure des Monsieur Vex Bois came in 1837 that was translated into English as the adventure of uh, uh, Mr. Ovadia Old Buckin in the 19th supplement offered by brother Jonathan, a newspaper format magazine published by Wilson and Co. in New York since 1839. And that is the significance of his presence is claimed in the global comics tradition. Even Goethe, right, I am sure that you all know this name, Goethe praised Toffer for his uh, picture novels, let note down it, right, picture novels in the early 1830s, despite his well known contempt for what he saw as the socially divisive malice of Carrie Ketcher. Now, we have looked at Hogarth, we have looked at Rolandson and Toffer who was highly influenced by English illustrator called David Kunzle. He was hailed in Victorian England as the new Hogarth and here we come a person called George Cruikshank, right and he is the one who called the new Hogarth, right. So, we have seen Hogarth, right, now you see we have seen now Rolandson and now we are going to see George Cruikshank, right. So, what does Cruikshank do with the comics, right. What is his contribution? His contribution is something that I would say is a kind of a blasphemy, right. Is a kind of a blasphemy that we see. What is a blasphemy, right? Blasphemy is something which is not at all acceptable in a particular custom and culture and it has element to create a kind of uproar in the society, right. So, why is it so that Cruikshank is being called the, as a blasphemous, right. I am actually looking at it in the way because he did something which was not acceptable in the academia of comic studies, right. Or to put it this way, in the comic studies tradition. So far, we have been 
seen lot of experiments done by various artists coming from different places in a different age. But first time someone called Cruikshank who came and he is going to do with the something which is very new in terms of a comic medium. He is talking about a particular form which people never thought about it. This is something called doodle man, right? which means he is going to speak about the story or he is going to float the narratives not with the help of a kind of a tradition given to him by the comic artist, but rather a kind of a sketch which is called doodle man. Right? So, let me show you uh, the image you yourself can infer what he did to comic studies. All right, so see you on the screen, and here you find that Doodleman, uh, which is nothing but he introduced a particularly what I say. Let me write it for you: a casual tone, sorry, casual tone in the polygraphic tradition. All right, so. <coughs> of the 19th century through the use of doodle man. So, let me repeat it for you that he introduced a particularly casual tone in the polygraphic tradition of the 19th century through the use of uh, doodle man which populated most of his works and can be found evidently in the OVO of Toffer as well. Right? So, here you see that division was there, right? Anti art was uh, anti art is something uh, which is, I would say, that the beginning of a comics, right? So the first time, what is happening is like something anti art. Let me give an example. I'm sure that you can relate it with your own understanding. I'm sure that we all have uh, read a lot of dramas, uh, starting from the Shakespeare, and then we have a Congreve and there is a lot of in between and there is a tradition of a writing drama. And when we come to read Osborne's look back in anger, right? and suppose if I ask you who is a hero in this uh, play, right? you will be bamboozled. Right? You will say is there a hero in the play? Right? If suppose I ask you what is the heroic quality? Right? Most of the dramas written by Shakespeare there is a hero, right? there is a protagonist, there is a person whom you see is really important around whom the story is revolving around. Right? And suppose if I ask you to put the Shakespeare's drama at one side and another side I ask you to read let us say Harold Pinter or Samuel Beckett or let us say look back in anger uh, by Osborne. And if I see look at found, find out the similarities, you will say no, there is nothing as such similarity. Right? Then why do we call it a drama? It is a drama. Then what is the difference? The difference is it is a kind of experiment which was never accepted in the genre called drama. In the same way what Cruikshank is doing with the doodle man is bringing a new changes and that is why if you call is a kind of anti art it would not be exaggeration. All right? So, look at this slide and I would ask you to pay your attention for 2 to 3 minutes like look at other slides and other pictures and then keep this picture which is on your screen together and then you will see the kind of a difference and changes I am talking about a kind of experiment that was made by Cruikshank. All right? So, see on your slides take a 2 minutes and then move ahead. All right? so, Cruikshank's sketches in Charles Dickens, The Loving Ballad of Lord Batman and his illustrator, illustrations for William Harrison and Swarth, Jack Shepherd, a romance. Right? <coughs> so, uh, Jack Shepherd, let me uh, put it. Uh, name on your uh, screen, right? Jack Shepherd, 
a romance, right. So, here you see the interesting thing that I am talking about, both published around the same time, right. Which one? Dickens, the loving ballad for Lord Bittman and then we have uh, Ensworth's uh, Jack Sefford, a romance. They both published around the same time, same time and are telling instances of how he tapped into the potential of a polygraphic space, right. So, here you see there is a person called novelist, he is also somewhere going to talk about polygraphic, right. So, Toffer's art a theory heavily indebted to the above illustrators and they would in time act as the transition between the tradition of humoristic illustrations, the awkward infantile spontaneous drawing in the 19th century and the world of a contemporary art at the state of 20th century. All right. So, now it is very ironic from this perspective that the way in which Toffer departs from Hogarth. Right. So, if I ask you how does it depart? So, these are the changes that took place from Hogarth to Toffer is in the excess of caricaturing rather than relying on standard artistic practices of proportions of pure and correct contours of accurate anatomy and reason perfections. Right. So, what I have been talking I just showed it to you that how the standard artistic practices were challenged and new things are coming into the picture. So, ever since the publication of an historical sketch of the art of caricaturing by James Piller Malcolm, right. Many artists including Toffer stayed away from formal taught drawing which promulgated academic art dictated, dictated by rational procedures and moved toward a realization of a genuine art imbued with lively individuality. So, to further explicate the use, use of caricature, Toffer also invokes the work of his contemporary French illustrator J. J. Grandville, right, whose stick figures, right, let me write it for you and use of minimalism and abstractions. Right. As opposed to Hogarth, the filled spaces lend itself even closer to the living, breathing core of its creator, while also exemplifying the reductivist aspect of art form. So, Toffer is thus able to create a radical and novel kind of sequential narrative which presents a perfectly coherent anti academic right anti academic view on art by the use of deliberative progressive action using the tools at a cartoonist disposal like the sketchiness of a caricature the mixing of a genre and the collision of a tones and styles is smoldering quite rightly notes that although despite being a theoretician, theoretician himself Toffer did not produce any theory of a comics, his entire scope of work implicitly encapsulate a theory in itself, alright. So, before I move ahead, let me uh, tell you what I mean by spontaneous theory of art, right. That is very important to understand, uh, because you see that I have been uh, taking the examples of literature to explain what it means, right. So, once again to understand what is why what is the spontaneous theory of art and most importantly how comics developed there are various ways. The one what happens there is a theory given to you before you come into the picture you are going to write something you all have a theory. Let me ask you something interestingly suppose you have to write a poem right. Suppose you are asked okay write a poem you will write a poem which will be accepted by the people if you have followed certain rhythm, certain stress, right, certain meters and people will appreciate you. 
what would happen let us say for example, then if you write a poem like a prose right and people say no, 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 it is not a prose, it is a poem right, it is not a prose, it is it's, it's not, it's, that is how you are not supposed to write. This is the very idea that you should not, you are not supposed to write like this. What does this mean? It simply suggests that there is already a formal theory available to you and you must comply with it. If you do not comply with it, it is not going to work, right? That is one thing. Second thing is what would happen? In fact, what happened after a point of time, the example that I gave you in terms of Osborne's writing. Let us say for example, what movements poet, poets did, they experimented, they challenged the traditional way of writing, right. For them, in fact, that is a huge uh, transition, I am sure that you could see uh, the way romantics challenged enlightenment period and the way it is writing, like Pope is not writing in the same way, the way Coleridge is writing. So, the point is that they both are accepted today as a form of a poetry, but during the enlightenment period or let us say new classical period, lot of work demanded to be produced in a formal way, right. And if it does not adhere to those prescriptions, they were not accepted. So, this is the same thing that we find, let us say for example, like in comics we find to make it more clear. Suppose, if I give you Satra, right. And I ask you read Sath's writing. After a point of time, you will say, Sir, it is an existentialist writing, right? But Sath never said it, right? Sath never says, or he has ever so, in fact, in when he's writing, that I am going to write an existentialist piece of work. No. But after reading, we formulate, we understand that it complies with existentialism, all right. So, in the same way, what is happening here that Topfer's writing is not going to give a formal theory, it is just in a practice and later on we find, in fact, lot of comic artists we find, oh, he is or she is talking about this. So, they do not talk about the formal theory, but it comes in a way that it gives you a theory, right. So, like a, you can relate it with the Saat. Saat is not writing existential, like he is not saying that he is writing, but he is giving us a way that how you are supposed to write if you are writing existentialist piece of work. So, now you understand this difference because this is a very significant and very important to understand how comic studies developed, all right. So, Going back to the slides, look at the slide please, there is a Grand Willis Musk which we are talking about. So, uh, here like uh, uh, I mean to understand a primitivist and a spontaneous theory of a comics as Topfer's Oveyors projects and which fails to establish itself as a theory altogether. A small difference suggests harking back to the German early romantic concept of witch, right? Early concept of a witch, which plays a strong influence on the artist following Topfer, Sam and Gustave Dore, right? This is a two people. Among others, as well as sing, signals Goethe's appreciation for early comics. So, while Goethe's enthusiasm for the works of a Topfer rises out of the elements of wits, which find expression in his own work, Wilhelm Mister's apprenticeship, right. So, this is finding echoing in his work already, Goethe's work, right. French philosopher, we have uh, Jean Luc Nancy, who traces the concepts of wits back to Lawrence Easton's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. So, Tristram's, listen to me carefully, Tristram's birth is the uncontrolled birth of a wit, who caricatures and parodies philosophy and literature. It is birth in philosophy as philosophy or as a mixture of multiple heterogeneous elements 
fringing around itself and philosophy. Tristram's birth is also perceived by the eponymous narrator as a mystic or an accident, where several ideas, mindsets and unconnected events coalesce to form the journey of his birth. Despite syntactically fracturing the structure of the novel, where the author's preface appears well after two entire volumes have been read, Easton's protagonist in a manner of a bragging about his erudition leans back on Locke's ideas on rationality and departs from it with the sense of a mockery of the source while suggesting a skewered idea of logic through his unfortunate life story. So, taking cue from the narrative of Tristram Sandy, Nancy goes on to describe with an association or combination that is unexpected, surprising or not sanctioned by ordinary rules and further as the union, the melange or let us say for example, the dissolutions of heterogeneous element. Under such terms, early comics can be said to have appeared as an offshoot of the already established culture of art and writing. With the traditional impetus of the printing press and mass culture, which allowed for certain creative divergence from the norm or artistic produce, production, the style of the tougher lens the style of a tougher despite drawing on the likes of Hogarth, Cruikshank and Rowlandson and anticipating the culture of a comics that would be followed by the likes of a Granville, Outcult and Mackay was distinct from each of them as theirs was from tougher's. The uniqueness of comic arts lay in the visual layout of the heterogeneous elements which functions as aspect of the medium on the printed page, which could range anywhere between the clustered and the noisy spaces of Hogarth to the spatially spaced abstract sketches of Rao Lansons, Granville and beyond. So, what is important here for us first to let me uh, try to explain more the concept of a width, so that you can understand more in detail. So, I mean, I just wanted to explain you with uh, uh, more meticulously, so that you can understand. I would suggest to you that if you have a time, please read Tristram Sandy by Lawrence Easton, right. What happens? There is a hero who is not complete, right. And it seems to me that he is in the process of making, he is constantly work like author is constantly working on it, but it is not complete. It is moving, it is constantly in process, it is in making, but it is being created by mistake, right. So, let me relate it with the Bildungs Roman, because that will be more familiar, like you are more familiar with the Bildungs Roman and you can easily relate. What happens? That this, that the hero is not complete, his development of a character is is in process, it goes on and on and on, but the difference between wits W I T Z and Bildungs Roman is after a point of time, the character or the hero of the Bildungs Roman is complete, right? It is nothing else after that, it is ok, you find it is a finished, it is in end, but what happens with the with it just goes on and on and on and on, it is not yet complete, right? It is not yet over, and it is being done by the mistake. Now, why I am talking about this technique? Why I am in the first place showing to you this kind of experiment? There is something called norm, right? In fact, uh, let me give you an example to make you understand what norm is. In fact, I would suggest you there is a very famous book and good one by. Uh, just to understand how norm works is by uh, Leonard J. Davis enforcing normalcy. But just to explain you what happens in the norm, there is a certain set of uh, practices, prescriptions given to you by the society and you have to follow that. Let us say for example, how do you identify 
that this is a not a marriage ceremony, this is a funeral or this is a funeral, this is not a marriage ceremony because you know that in a marriage ceremony this, 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 this takes place, right. It is not that by since the earth exists, we have got the norm, it changes according to the culture as the society evolves, it norms also changes, right. But if you do not follow that, you will be outcast, right you will be punished or people will not be able to recognize what kind of act you are performing. Let us say for example, I am teaching, so you get to know because there is a norm of a teaching, right. You have to wear a particular set of clothes and a particular in setup, right. I cannot go in a restaurant and you say that I am teaching to students. However, students are available there, I am eating with them, but you see you will, so, you will not say that Vivek sir sitting in the classroom and teaching, right. So, this is a particular norm. So, what is happening? Comic studies has also prescribed certain norms, but now in this particular time you see that wits like experiment is being done where they are challenging given norms to you, right. So, way of creating humor is becoming different. So far the kind of a norms available to write comics is being constantly challenged by certain other comic artists or comic artists who have like bringing some other kind of a forms of level in certain other kind of a art and they are experimenting with it. But it does not mean that they are not writing comics because if you recall my lecture on the definition of a comics, I wanted to establish this very fact that we should understand this that it is very difficult to define the complexity and the historicity of comics, all right. So, this is what I wanted to explain to you in terms of widths and norms in relation to comic studies. So, going back to the slide please, now you see on your slide that when we uh, uh, talk about uh, these kind of uh, things that, that the novel in prints comes into the picture. So, where we have the novel in prints tradition that began with the publication of Topfer's first work, I would write it for you, uh, his Toire the Mr. Jabot that came out in 1835 by Toffer, right. So, this is a work I wanted you to uh, note down in case you are interested in reading it. So, encountered this novel in print tradition, encountered a diffusion for about the next 25 years years before being muddled into perception that refused to see comics as an original form of production altogether. So, there were three major reasons for this gradual decline in the recognition of a form visibly different from the popular novel. And this is where I want you to have a focus on that what were those three conditions or let us say for example, three reason for which uh, you see there is a decline. So, first there was a culture of a showcasing and selling pirated copies of said novels in prints, in bookshops. For instance, Albert, right, note down this name. Albert, a very famous bookstore in France sold pirated editions of Toffer's Mr. Mr. Jabot, right, Mr. Crepin and we also have Mr. Vioux Boys, right. So, what we see this is a famous edition of a top verse, Mr. Jabot, Mr. Crepin, Mr. Wixbus that was uh, uh, came out in the pirated edition and was sold by Aubert, a very famous bookstore in France, which met with a considerable amount of a success. However, the fact that readers did not care to distinguish the original form, original from the pirated was a matter of concern for the artist himself, who commented on the practice that it took away the craving for spontaneity that an artist usually wants to portray in the production and once the mass printed copies were out in the bookstores, 
they looked different in the artist vision appeared inane where it seemed funny, stupid, where it looked amusing. Secondly, we have the acceptance of uh, plagiarized work of a comic artist as a norm, further denigrated the form as one in which originally was not of a primary concern. So, this is the second reason and then we have the third one. So, here I wanted to show you the comparison between Toffer's Mansur crypto game and Sam, the strange adventures of Bachelor Butterfly. So, you see these two, right? You look at the similarity, right? You could see that how they both look so the same. All right. So, moving ahead, the third reason what we see, uh, in fact, uh, just one more uh, thing that I would like to tell you. The Sam is a basically nothing is a called a, like, like a nickname of the person called Charles. Amede de Noé, they are a French name obviously you know that. So, he, he is the one who is better known as Sam, right. All right. I just wanted to uh, uh, let you know, so that you know that it is not a name, but it is known as a name, all right. Okay. So, uh, he was a student of Toffer, right. He was a student of Toffer and is as known as American readers as the author in the second author of the second comic published by Wilson and Co in 1846 the strange adventure of bachelor butterfly which was a 68 pages long translation of Sam's plagiarism like look at this Sam's plagiarism of Toffer's Monsure crypto game right so this is this is exactly why I, I, I show you the pictures. The reason is you can understand this. Look at these two pics, right? The one is the original one, and the second one you see is a plagiarized one, right? Now you see that the disciple, I mean, you say the person who learned from a Toffer, he is the one who is doing it. So he is like Chapman's plagiarism of Toffer's Manchur crypto game originally conceived by Toffer in 1830, right. So, initially uh, this very idea, this very figure, this very figure has already came out in 1830, but in the plagiarized version we are again going to meet like we again may, we again meet him in 1846, right. So, this is what plagiarism I am talking about. And thirdly and ironically the success of comic arts among the general public in the late 1850s was inversely proportionate to chances of the novel in prints being considered as a distinct genre and comics being perceived as a unique medium akin to be called with much later in the lifetime. In France, Toffer's work was perceived as an eccentric comic novel related to Lawrence Stern's Tristram Sandy and in England comics were likened to the works of the two principal comic novelists of the period Charles Dickens, William Macpies, Thackeray, all right. So, what I am talking about here is that I am trying to show you how this picture stories, right or novel in print tradition declined. As I told you like previously itself that old technology gets superseded, get replaced by new technology. So, a lot of things come into the picture that becomes one of the important reason that why something declines and something comes in the rise. I it is very very famous question to like explain it beautifully that why, why did not Shakespeare write even a single novel, right. Like if you say he has written drama, he has written poetry, he has written historical plays, everything, but not novel. The reason is the kind of a culture, the kind of society, the kind of a technology was available and what kind of a demand in the society was rise of the novel was not possible, right. It came very late after the periodical papers came into the existence. In the same way, when we see what are the reasons why a particular culture is getting replaced by new particular culture 
in comic studies right so the new comic culture is coming into the existence so these are the three important reason i would like to explain to you and i'm sure that you will pay attention to this because it's a very significant so there's a culture of showcasing and selling pirated copies of novel in prints in the bookshops all right so what is happening that that lot of pirated copies are come like after the print it is becoming very possible for everyone to get the pirated copies of label let me like i'm sure that uh, most of us are indulged in watching pirated movies like let's say for example we download from some different sites obviously there is a lot of like there is a very minute difference right let's say in terms of uh, picture in terms of sounds but it's very hard to tell that it is not the original one right it is hard to tell that's not the original one so now you tell me then uh, if it is being consumed by people and they are not bothered that we are not reading original one what will be the incentive for the comic artist to read these kind of uh, uh, comic books or oh, sorry to write these kind of a uh, comic books why will they write these kind of a uh, comics books when there is no incentive right so obviously they will not write anymore so this is the one important reason the second what we see that people have accepted the plagiarized works of a comic art as a norm right which obviously resulted in the denigration of the form which which for which like originality is not a concern i showed you the picture also that uh, the same kind of a hero is being reproduced by different kind of a comic artist and we are not bothered about it so this is the second reason that uh, resulted in the decline of it all right so these are the like major important concern that we should see for the decline of the picture stories or novel in print tradition so here what we find interestingly that one tradition is being replaced by the new kind of tradition coming into the picture so it's not that uh, we should uh, like be sad about it obviously it's a important concern but as a student as a student of literature or say for example as a scholar who are uh, engaging with comic studies we have to find out what are the things that is taking place in between what are the changes what are the shift that are taking place in the history of comic studies and how it evolved all right so here i'll uh, uh, end this lecture see you next time with continuing what i'm today talking with the new ideas with the new vistas and further changes and new perspectives all right see you next time bye bye